Episcopal lesson comes from 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9. From Paul, called by God, will be, will be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and so the knees, is that right? Sosthenes, our brother, to God's church that is in Corinth. To those who have been made holy to God in Christ Jesus, who are called to God's people, Together with all those who call upon the name of Lord Jesus Christ in every place, he's their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always for you because of God's grace that was given to you in Christ Jesus. That is, you were made rich through him in everything, in all your communications and every, th every kind of knowledge. In the same way that the testimony about Christ was confirmed with you. The result is that you aren't missing any spiritual gift while you wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also confirm your testimony about Christ until the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and you are called by him to partnership with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Things are changing so fast. We used to say that uh, the only thing that's constant is change. And now the only thing that's constant is the acceleration of change. A friend of mine was on an airplane, and the flight attendant came over the PA and says, this flight has, the first time for the first time in aviation history, will have Wi-Fi available to the passengers during the flight. Well, the guy next to my friend pulled out his laptop, flipped it open, got busy. About 20 minutes later, the Wi-Fi went down. The stewardess came on and says, I'm sorry to report that our Wi-Fi is no longer available. And the guy just slammed down the lid of his laptop and says, this is unbelievable. But he said something else. <laughs> you know, 20 minutes before, he hadn't even thought that he could use his laptop and get Wi-Fi on the airplane. And now he was upset that it was gone. We have a hard time being satisfied these days. There's a group called the American Customer Satisfaction Institute. They put out the American Customer Satisfaction Index every year. And one of the things they do is that they survey people who have traveled by, by airplane to find out what the average customer satisfaction level is. And unfortunately, it's number 43 of the various industries that they, they measure, just above cable television and internet access. <laughs> the problem is that things lose their luster. We'd like to go back to those good old days. And it seems the church has lost its luster too, except when we read Corinthians, we discover that here, just 20, 30 years after the resurrection, here's a church that is going through all kinds of struggles. Paul is writing to a dysfunctional group of people. There are grabs for power. There is misuse of the sacrament. There are people sleeping around. There are... Uh, fights and battles and marriages melting down. Sounds like most every church. I used to think that was just Corinthians. I mean, I just thought that was kind of the, you know, the L.A. of the ancient world and all the fruits and nuts wound up there. But no, I got into the church. I discovered you pop the hood of any church and you're going to see a lot of cracks and leaks and you're going to hear some rattles and some rumbles because we are all here, not because we're good enough to be a church. We're here because we got touched by Jesus Christ. And we still need his love. Paul is writing them about all their problems. He's not going to let it ride. But first of all, and Paul's a master of this. First of all, he says, he tells the good news. At the end, he's going to tell the good news. Now, in the middle, there's going to be a long road to hoe, but don't forget the good news. And he tells them right here in the beginning three things that he is hugely satisfied 
with in their life. Grace, gifts, and a guarantee. Grace. He thanks the Lord. I always, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Jesus Christ. This is not about what wonderful, loving things they've done. This is the marvelous thing that created the church in the first place. It's the grace of Jesus Christ. It is the power of the good news alive in the church. Sure, there's problems. There's always problems. But God's grace keeps coming through and changing everything. That's what we can be thankful for. It's Jesus Christ that makes the church. I mean, yeah, we've got our struggles. We've got meetings that get to be kind of contentious. We've got plans that go astray. Things don't work out right, and yet God has chosen to work through us and for us in grace. And that's a wonderful thing. That is a reason to be thankful and satisfied. The second thing is the gifts. Paul says, you've been enriched with all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ has confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift. Not only has God graced them that they are held together, but God has seen to it that there are plenty of gifts among the people to make it work. Every church has gifts. It's like the preacher said, if we've got enough money to build a new building, we only have one problem, it's still in your pockets. Well, that's the way it is with gifts. Think about the gifts that have been given to this church through people. I don't mean just monetary or just uh, capital improvements. I mean the gifts of new ministry, of reaching out to people, of being the presence of God in this community, in this world, that are happened because people with God-given gifts have gotten them started, and we all have one. We all have talents. We are called to invest them in the grace of God. And when that happens, we have plenty to be satisfied with. But to top it off, it's not just the grace of God that brought us together and holds us together. We wouldn't stay together if it wasn't for the grace of God. And it's not just the gifts that, that empower a ministry for God of being the resurrected body of Christ in this place. It is the promise that Christ gives us and gave the church in Corinth. It's a promise that supersedes anything they might believe or do. Ultimately, Paul wrote, the church is waiting for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you in the end. The foundation of each and every local church is the truth that despite all our imperfection, the end is not in doubt. The end is in Christ. And it is an end of fulfillment, of resurrection, and we will be found faultless as the kingdom comes and we are lifted up in Jesus Christ. Isn't that marvelous? We live in a world where we're always looking at the wrong end of the stick. We have a 24-7 news coverage that teaches us that we should just look at problems and faults and failures. And sure, we're human. We are so short on patience, it's unbelievable. Everything is awesome, but no one is happy. Have you notice that? You, you get upset when it takes long, too long on your 
smartphone to bring up your Facebook page. What's wrong? That signal had to go all the way into space and back again, and then into space and back again to get to your phone. Is the speed of light too slow for you? How about the speed of God's love, though? And all this other stuff is just really secondary. We start thinking about airlines, and sure, we all have our favorite stories of how terrible a flight was, but think about it. Think about this, that 110 years ago, this couldn't have happened. You were strapped into a chair, flying through the sky at 550 miles an hour. You went from New York to Los Angeles in three hours, a journey that would take a year in the old days, and you'd lose half your clan getting there. We live in an awesome world, and we live in an awesome world because of the blessings of God that start with grace that brings us together and grants us gifts to express that grace in the world. And it's based on a promise, on a guarantee that Christ is with us. We accept that when we become part of Christ's body, part of the church, and we receive it. You realize when you are touched by the power of the cross, you become a son or a daughter, an inheritor of the kingdom of God. Keep this in mind. You are not individual people, a person without a family or a country, not all by yourself, stuck in this bag of protoplasm. You are a child of God. You are an inheritor. It's in the will. And it's yours. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't get rid of it. And you can't have it just because you want it. It's been given to you freely. Mm -hmm.